Uh, Assalamualaikum. Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you all for come here. Uh, saya akan jawab soalan anda. I will answer your question. Apa ni? Uh, komen mengenai timbalan menteri yang nikah online with the imam in a masjid kedai baru di Golok. First of all, <laughs> fitnah. Fake news. Mana ada masjid yang call itself masjid kedai baru? Huh? Is it a kedai or a masjid? <laughs> How would you feel if I buka a kedai and call it Masjid baru ha, Confuse tak you all ha, You nak datang sembahyang ke Nak beli buku Confuse Confuse ha, Tapi seperti yang dijelaskan oleh The Timbalan Menteri Ini perkara peribadi This is a private matter ha, Why are you all sibuk-sibuk Provoke-provoke ni ha? The Timbalan Menteri Told Sina Harian And I quote Isu seperti ini Sepatutnya tidak berlaku hmm? But does he mean that The nikah patutnya tidak berlaku No, no, no The video patutnya tidak berlaku Who would be so stupid To break the law And then video And then upload the video online It shouldn't have happened ha? Takkan uh, You nak makan durian-durian PKPP Ataupun you nak Visit your friend for lunch And then upload the video online It shouldn't have happened You will not do it ha? What's that? The timbalan yang dipetua Majlis Agama Islam Wilayah Naratiwat Abdul Aziz Cik Mat menjelaskan pihaknya tidak pernah mengiktiraf pernikahan secara dalam talian. <laughs> This is where he is wrong. Ini bukan secara talian. Nobody is calling-calling. Halo-halo. Tak ada. This was online. Atas talian. On the line. Ha, macam Tinder. Eh, macam Grindr. Hmm? What is Grindr? I don't know. Anyway, they didn't call in calling. Uh, this one is video calling. Ini norma baru. Uh, but, but once again, I repeat, it shouldn't have happened. But why nikah right now during this time when the entire country is struggling, orang yang tak ada makan, tak ada nasi, and why nikah in the first place? Hmm. Ini you kena salahkan Spanish fly. Hi, Arith Iskandar, 60 Second Response. You've heard about the Bendera Putih Movement, a wonderful initiative encouraging people who are desperate kepada mana-mana rumah yang terputus bakalan makanan and they need immediate help to reach out by waving a white flag tak perlu malu, tak perlu merayu. Now, in the wake of this fantastic initiative, the Ahli Parliament of Bacho, Nick Ado, responded by saying, Angkat tangan berdoa, bukan angkat bendera putih, suggesting that the power lies in prayer and not in a white flag. <laughs> I have a suggestion. Combine the two. If you're hungry and you have no money and you haven't eaten for three days because the ongoing pandemic has destroyed your livelihood, how about you angkat bendera putih and then angkat tangan berdoa and hope that someone sees your bendera putih and brings you and your kids some rice and some vegetables and maybe a little milk because you have been feeding your six-month-old baby syrup because you couldn't afford milk. That is a true story, by the way. Saya angkat tangan berdoa that you've enjoyed my 60-second response. <coughs> Check one two one two. Ah, uh, the on. Okay. Ha, assalamualaikum. Apa semua? Uh, thank you for come here today. Uh, I uh, need to explain the new SOP. Ha, uh, new SOP. Because I know a lot of the raya is confused. Ah, uh, I don't know why the confuse. It's actually very easy. The new SOP is almost the same as the old SOP. And the old SOP was just like the old new SOP. Ah, senang aja. Uh, so if you have any question, please ask question. Ah, iya dia, apa dia? Alcohol. Ah, uh, alcohol uh, categorized by the National Security Council as non-essential. Ah, therefore, uh, banned. Ah, tak boleh jual. It's banned. Tak boleh. Cannot. Cannot. Lagi pun alcohol is no good for the SOP uh, because when people the drinking drinking then they come out wah wow, suddenly they love love everybody they see their people the friend they want to hug the friend I love you brother oh, you are like my brother tak boleh ni patah SOP the SOP is broken tak boleh one meter must keep away uh, any any other question hmm? cigarette rokok uh, uh, rokok is also non essential tapi boleh jual Ah, why? Because it's essential to the cigarette addict. Ah, 
You don't know. If you are not a smoker, you will understand. Do you smoke? Ah, you don't smoke. Where are you from? Ah, police. No wonder lah. <laughs> you don't know. Cigarette addict. They must get the cigarette. If they don't get, it will be a problem. Huh? Tak dapat rokok dia suddenly like, eh, eh, geram je macam, mm, mm, tak boleh. We must look after our addicted rakyat. Ah, we must take care of them. Ah, lagipun, if you have no cigarette, ah, then the rakyat, what happened to them? Ah, what will happen? They will turn to heroin. Ah, macam mana? Macam mana betul? Macam mana tu? Ah, you know how difficult it is to shoot up heroin when you are doing Zoom conference? Susah tu. Tengah Zoom, Zoom, you want to... You want to ikat ni. Susah. Cannot. At least dengan rokok, eh, boleh. Rokok, you just, you just light, you light under the table. Ah, senang tu. Ah, the, apa? Do I smoke? Eh, it's not about me. It's not about me. I'm not important myself. It's about the rakyat. The rakyat, we must look after them. Ah, so, uh, I think macam ni, uh, kalau apa-apa, there's nothing else. I just nak pergi rokok. Roku, rok. Roku Zen Pergi my friend restaurant Not uh, I take away Take away from the restaurant Because now cannot eat at the restaurant Hi, Harith Iskandar With a 60 second response To this news item Kementerian Kesihatan menjelaskan mana-mana individu yang terbukti diberikan suntikan vaksin Picagari kosong akan menerima suntikan dos baru. Menterinya Datuk Seri Dr. Adham Baba berkata pihaknya akan memanggil individu berkenaan untuk menerima suntikan semula. Prove that you were given an empty syringe and the ministry will contact you to give you a proper dose. I have two questions. One, how do I prove I received an empty syringe? And two, how do I prove I received an empty syringe? There's a sign outside the door that clearly says no video camera allowed. Or you can take an antibody test to find out. Or oh, so now the onus is on me to prove that you didn't give me the vaccination that you said you would. But here is what really concerns me. The reaction of, oh, you had an empty syringe, that will prove it, we'll give you another jab. This isn't like going to the mechanic. Oh, we didn't change your engine oil, that will prove it, we'll change your engine oil. It should be, we didn't actually give you the vaccine which we promised we were going to give you to potentially save your life. And if you hadn't videotaped it, we would never have known, I am so sorry. Why didn't they react that way? You know what's worse? Amongst the millions, and I mean millions of vaccinations already given out, these few incidents have spoiled it for the thousands of good honest Malaysians who've been working so hard to make this vaccination program a success. This is Harith Iskander with a slightly longer response than 60 seconds. Get vaccinated. Hi, Harith Iskander with a 60 second response. Hamelin uh, TV uh, from IG asked, Mr. Harith Iskander, why you can't run for Prime Minister? First of all, thank you for the kind message. And secondly, to become Prime Minister in Malaysia, you need to first be the leader of a political party or a coalition. And then your party or coalition needs to win the actual election, at which point the PM is chosen by the members of the parliament, usually made up of members of the winning party. Which begs the question, what if we, the Rakyat, could actually choose the Prime Minister or any other minister? for that matter. So for example, what if we, the Raya, could vote for person A to be the Prime Minister, uh, and he's from this party, and, but we like person B to be the Minister of Education, and he's from a different party. And then we like person C to be the Home Minister, and he's a complete independent, which means instead of ministers being chosen from the pool of people who are members of the one winning party, we get to elect the person that we think could actually be best for the job. So, <laughs> what about that? Arith Iskander, 60 second response. Hey, it's Harith Iskandar, 60 second response. I got a direct message on Facebook from a Joe Harith who asked, Harith, you anti Melayu ke? Nak dapat sokong non-bumi sebab family you semua tak ada Malays. Lucky your late father, Melayu bracket soldier. Kalau dia ada, sedih tengok you sekarang. Okay, I tried to reply to Joe Harith directly on Facebook, but I think he blocked me. I could not do that, so I'm putting it out there. My late father, Colonel Musa bin Muhammad, uh, waktu dia di hutan during the communist insurgency in the 60s and 70s, alongside all the other soldiers that Pada berbagai bangsa of the six regiment ranges tak pernah fikir kita sedang bertugas untuk mempertahankan bumi ataupun non bumi. Jangan semua fikir kita bertugas untuk mempertahankan rakyat Malaysia. So I don't think my late father would be sedih to see what I'm doing now. Tapi mungkin dia sedih kalau dia tahu ada juga orang Malaysia zaman ini yang ada mentaliti yang kata kita hanya boleh sokong bumi atau hanya boleh sokong non bumi. I'm Harith Iskandar, 60 second response. Saya sokong Malaysia.
Am I mute? Am I mute? I'm okay. Was I mute? Oh my God, guys, apparently I have been mute all this time. Let me see. No sound. Can I hear you, Harith? Okay, thank you, Jimmy. Go, thank you for letting me. Francine, Joseph, you're on mute, man. Ah, Neil idea. Uh, when you say too many things, the got certain people want to mute me. Guys, I was on mute for a whole minute and you, you kept watching. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. That is the world of technical jargon, which basically means uh, I completely forgot to unmute myself. But welcome once again to another episode of What's Going On Malaysia. This is a back-to-back -back episode. We had a, a great episode last night with the YB Tony Pua. And we have another awesome, awesome, awesome episode tonight. Uh, thank you guys, everybody, for pointing out that uh, I was on mute. Doris Lee, Trima Kasi. Brand Ho. Yeah, Brand. I didn't have that little translator in the in the corner here, right? Like, uh, you know, imagine a little, we should, I should get myself one of those deaf translators at the side. So even if I'm on the mute, you guys can still hear what I am saying. Awesome idea. I'm going to put that into my things to do list. Little translator right here in this little box over here. Hey, CTO, good evening. Viva Supermanium. Good evening from Penang. Yes, Sepati Besser. Uh, let me know where you are watching from. Uh, let me know uh, where you are based. Uh, because this show, because it's on the internet, goes out to literally across the world. If not just across Malaysia, but across the world. If you're watching on YouTube, if you're watching on Facebook, Thank you for watching. And if you are watching this episode like the next day, if you are not watching it live, don't worry about it because as far if nobody gave you any spoilers, it's just like you're watching it live, right? Okay, guys, you have sounds, Liao, Harith, Harith is kind of back to back from yesterday evening, Steve Chong. Thanks, Steve Chong, for, for putting into subtitles what everybody missed in the first place. I uh, am... I'm, it's a Sunday night. I, I know I shouldn't be so hyper and so hype, but I thought to myself, you know what? We're going to take a break. We're going to take, because the last few episodes, no, in fact, almost every single episode has been heavily packed on to politics. And because Malaysian politics changes day by day, you know, there's always something to talk about, right? So there's always something to put your finger on and there's always something to complain about. Now, not to say that today we will not be in a sense complaining, but we will be talking about an important issue, uh, certainly most important to me, and I hope it's important to you. Uh, Chef Circle is watching from Nene's house. <laughs> Chef Circle, where is your Nene? We'd like to know. Esther is watching from Klang. Hemavani is watching from Singapore. What's up, Singapore? We're going to miss Singapore. Bai Sheng Ling is a Malaysian watching from Taiwan. Good evening to you. I AICTE is from Melbourne. Mason is from New South Wales. Garai, Mike. Yes, Garai. Suzanne Lee is from T is from Seremban. Uh, I don't think I have a Seremban accent. Shimola is watching from Singapore from all over the world. Thank you so much for being with me tonight. 
Tonight, guys, we are going to be talking about education. Now, just to give you a little bit of background, and I want to hear from all of you who are watching. Hello from Batu Pahat. Hello, Catherine. And Richie Oi is in the COVID center in Klang. Richie, I hope you're okay. Uh, uh, I hope uh, you are, uh, for whatever reason that you are in the COVID center, I hope you are uh, doing well. Uh, Leslie Tio from Boley Land. We're going to be talking about education. So, uh, me, myself, let me give you my education background. Uh, dari tingkatan 1 sampai tingkatan 5, or uh, daja 1 sampai daja 6, I was in Sekolah Rendah St. John's, Bukit Nanas. Uh, satu biru, dua merah, tiga merah, empat merah, enam, lima merah, enam merah. Uh, before that, in kindergarten, I actually uh, went to the Alice Smith School um, in, in Jalan Bellamy, which was uh, just for two years. Um, but uh, then I went to Sekolah Kebangsaan from uh, Dajah 1 sampai Dajah 6. Then from Tikatan 1 sampai Tikatan 5, I also went to Sekolah Kebangsaan which was uh, St. John's Institution. Sekolah Menengah Kebangsaan uh, St. John's. Sharifa, Sharif Rosita is watching from Bristol. Bristol, right? Yeah, welcome to the show. I don't even know if they talk like this in Bristol. I'm just making it up. I'm sure they don't, but never mind. Shalom, thank you. Kota Kinabalu, Marcia Jarenas, thank you for watching from Kota Kinabalu. So I basically had a primary and secondary education in Sekolah Kebangsaan. And I think most of you may have guessed by now, I was not a most amazing student. Uh, I, did your, I did the Form 5 assessment test. I did the Form 3 test, which in those days was called SRP. And then I did the Form 5 test, which was called SPM. And my parents ha had saved up enough Stuttgart, Jason Saw is watching from Stuttgart. I hope that's Stuttgart, Germany. What time is it in Germany, Jason Saw? Thank you for watching from Germany. Let me continue my story. Um, yes, my parents had saved up uh, their money as I was growing up, and they sent me to Perth, Curtin University in Western Australia to do my matriculation and then to get my degree. Well, they sent me to university to get my degree, and I got my degree. So... That was my educational background from a point of view of uh, what we're going to be talking about today. So I am Sekolah Kebangsaan. Let me know, guys, what, what type of school you went to. Pergi ke sekolah mana? Was it Sekolah Kebangsaan? Was it private school? Did you go to school? Was it home, homeschooling? Was it home learning? Let me know in the comment section. And remember to share this stream. Share this show. Whether you are watching it live or watching it later, please share it. And if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe. Subscribe and hit that bell. I think the bell is on this side somewhere, down here somewhere. Hit that bell uh, because apparently that bell is like uh, a way that you get to know when I'm on coming on next. So subscribe and hit that bell. Kindred Spirits is watching from Edinburgh. Guys, uh, I don't know whether you are Malaysian, but also let me know uh, what, what type of school you went to, be it private or public or Sekolah Kebangsaan or home learning, or maybe you dropped out at Form 3 or Standard 5. Uh, maybe you didn't go to school. Maybe you went to the School of Hard Knocks. Because tonight, we are going to be talking about education. And let's face the facts, Tuan Tuan Dan Tuan Tuan, specifically in the, in the, in the scope of Malaysia. Uh, there have been many issues brought up uh, in terms of education. Um, when I was growing up, uh, I was... Uh, in the batch of where everything was in Bahasa Malaysia. Um, and then before that, it was science, science and maths was in English and a lot of the other subjects were in English as well. In fact, English was also taught in English. Hmm. How about that? Who would have thought, right? Taufik, Malaysian working in Brunei, Darul Salam. Thank you, Mr. Taufik, for watching the show. And then along the way, I think they have flip-flopped in the last 30 years between maths and science being taught in English and then taught in Bahasa and then taught in English, Bahasa Malaysia, and a big debate. Like, should it be taught in English or should it be taught in Bahasa? Well, tonight we are going to be talking about maybe this debate or whether something should be taught in English or Bahasa or whatever may not even be valid because we are talking about 20 21. Exactly, Richard Gomez. It's not just about the system being English language, but the overall quality and what is in the curriculum and the co-curricular scope. To la dear. Already, we've got the people piping in with their opinions, and that is exactly what I want you to do. I want you to uh, put it in the comment section, put your questions in the comment section, put your comments in the comment section, and we hope to bring it up and refer to them because tonight, my guest, um, 
I, I have met him a few times before. I can't say that uh, we know each other that well. We don't, but I, I have met him. I, I have uh, much respect for the work he does. And he has also written a book, which uh, he is going to tell us about and talk to us about. The book is called Out of Whack. Uh, this is the book. Uh, pretty cool, pretty cool cover, if you ask me. Uh, I like it. I like it. It's got the, it's almost um, animation caricaturist in its uh, appearance. But Out of Whack is the title of the book, and Out of Whack is what we're going to be talking about in terms of the Malaysian education system. Because according to my friend, this gentleman, thank you for watching, Chris, from Toronto, Canada, that the Malaysian education system is out of whack. Now, what does he mean by that? You know what? Let's not speculate. Let's not guess. Let's talk to the gentleman himself. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for commenting. Thank you for sharing. And I'm going to bring in my guests. Please welcome to this to the live streaming. This is Professor Dr. Dato Jailers Yo. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Harry. Good evening, everybody. Uh, how are you doing? You okay? Well, keeping fit, trying to be sane. Keeping fit and trying to be sane. Okay, so uh, first yeah. of all, let's get past the obvious. Uh, everybody, when they heard your name, they're like, wow, I'm so jealous that you have him on your show. Bada bing. I'm sure you must get this a thousand times a day. <laughs> Is anybody jealous of you? Jealous? Well, I, I, I think the... <laughs> well, they, they can't get my name right, but it's okay. So it's called okay. Jails, all right? So what, how is, what is the uh, absolute correct pronunciation? How should I call you? Jails. Jails, all right. All right. Jails, Professor Jails, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, agreeing to be on the show because uh, I needed to get away from the political storm that's been happening. And today we're going to talk about politics. But as you face it, as you think about it, Politics is also tied into the whole political system because education is one of the pillars of any society uh, specific. And, I'm, you know, Malaysia is within that realm. Before we go, uh, Prof. Jails, please, could you just take 45 seconds to a minute to um, tell the people here a little bit about yourself just so that they get to know you before we launch into the topic of tonight, which is why is Malaysian education system out of whack? So let the people know, let the, let the viewers know, let the streamers know uh, a little bit about yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Harif. Uh, precisely, I'm an educationist for, I spent my life uh, 25 years in education. Started as a, a teacher in a government servant, left the job, yeah, obviously frustrated with the government back those two years ago and become an entrepreneur educationist uh, and started my own career. Uh, currently, I'm the president and, uh, and CEO of the company that I started some six years ago called Ames Mac Executive Education. I'm the professor of globalization of Asia Metropolitan University, a university owned by the known country Dr. R. Palin, which is owned by a listed company. Uh, I'm also the author of the book, that the first book that I'm authoring about Out of Whack, uh, mainly to touch on the reform of education. Uh, to me, there's much to do about what's happening in education. My passion all the time has always been about education being for everybody and how we should change education for the benefit of many, not just for a few. Thank you, Arif. Okay, so uh, when you say, let, let's just start off, let's just kick off right on that. You said we should change education, not just for the benefit of a few. Actually, what is, what is, wrong, with, what is wrong with the current education system? Let me know. Okay, let, let, let's look at it, Harry. When you started just now and when we look at everybody and when we reflected back ever since we have gone independence, our education system we inherited from the British education system. 60 okay. years we are colonized. Right? We, we all know, and you just mentioned just now, two years in kindergarten, six years in primary schools, five years in secondary school, one or two years in matriculation, and then three to four years in tertiary education, you went to Australia, and then postgraduate, one and a half years, and then another four years for a doctorate. These, we inherited a system, yeah, which is 60 years ago. And now we have got our independence. 
we have moved from being colonized to what we are. We want to build a Bangsa Malaysia. We never change that system, have we? Uh, and don't we have enough elite people in the university? We have the government running this country from how many elections, I cannot remember, and I don't want to go into politics. We have ministers that come in there, but nobody dares to challenge the status quo. So this is something that we need to think about. Yeah, because if we do not do that, we are inheriting something that we continue to put people in boxes. We continue to put kids like us who were born back in the 60s. I'm born in the 60s. I'm, I'm sure, Dr. Haru, you are much younger than me. We've gone through that. But kids mm -hmm. today, your kids, your children, Harif, three beautiful kids that you have, are not born in the 60s. How do we expect to put them in the same boxes again for the next 30 years of their life? That's something we need to think about. Yeah? So, okay, let's... That's, that's the system. Yeah. What, what is wrong? What is wrong with the, the system, the current boxes, in your opinion? In my opinion, of course, when you try to pick people into the boxes, then you go back to the curriculum. So you start designing the curriculum. And then you start to say that these are the subjects that people must do when they are in kindergarten. And who dictates that? Who says that? So you get the educationist. You, every kindergarten, every primary school, every secondary school, whether it's private or, or, or government, has to be approved by the government. In other words, no matter what you want to do, you can't change this if you put boxes. So the curriculum has to be approved. So you are teaching people exactly what you have taught kids 60 years ago or 100 years ago right, in these boxes. And when you have things in boxes, our real life are not in boxes. We don't live in boxes. Today's kids don't live in boxes. The technology doesn't move you in boxes. And so we have to look at that. And therefore, we need to change this because it is not just about imparting something that is within credit hours or curriculum, root learning, and this is what you must do in mathematics, this is what you must do in science, and when you come to mathematics, it's mathematics, it's science, and this is Bahasa Malaysia, this is English. Uh, so these are things that we should change. We should move on. We should integrate them in many sense. And I see that happening in private education at the moment in Malaysia. All right, there's something happening, but the government is not because the government still controls politically. Education is still controlled by the Ministry of Education for any primary, secondary or kindergarten. Higher education, tertiary like we in universities are controlled by higher education. So as much as you want to do changes to this three years or five, you can't do it. I give you a very example, Harif, all right? So I, I, I go back to, to school leavers something that is very used to every one of us because many kids now have just finished their SPM. You still call it SPM. Those days was MC and so on. He said, now, why are we not making changes to it? So you still do that. After you finish SPM, either you go to a diploma if you cannot qualify for a degree. And why must diploma be three years? Because of the system. Why can't be diploma be two years? In Singapore and in other countries, diplomas are already in two years. But as long as we still put all the systems together, we cannot get out of the box. So we may have a lot of ideas. We may be able to push certain courses, let's say a diploma in, in business study or entrepreneurship in one and a half years, because you just need that one and a half years. And the other one year, you go straight into the industry and gain that experience. But of course, a diploma in nursing is different. A diploma in nursing next three years because it is a nursing program is something different. So, but because you standardize and you want to go into the boxes and say a diploma must be in three years. And here in Malaysia, we have something called MQA who dictates that. And, and it, is like, it is like a Bible and nobody can go against it. Uh, so this is where we have to think about it. Yeah, I, uh, I I agree with you. Of course, uh, the concept of boxes is is almost traditional. It's almost historical, and uh, uh, a common phrase that we've all heard is "take outside the box." And yet, we still have the box right there. Let Let me ask you this: the last one and a half years or more during the pandemic, most schools, most institutions have been shut. Everyone has moved across, or attempted to move across to e-learning. Uh, I've got three kids who, uh, for the last year and a half, have been sitting in front of their laptop or their device uh, from 8.30 in the morning till you know, 3.30 in the afternoon, which uh, the education system 
up to this point, up to March last year, was not designed for that. So, you know, in my opinion, they, they have been put at a disadvantage. I could see on the teachers uh, and I could see on the students because neither has been programmed or to work within this platform. Uh, what, what, if, what do you think about this? Exactly. So, actually, when we were talking about IR 4.0 back then, we were saying that we should be able to do blended learning, all right? Uh, we are trying to say that even in, in, uh, in primary school or secondary school, uh, you do not need to actually uh, be in the school for uh, six hours a day or eight hours a day, cut it three hours, and you do some blended. But it did not happen because we were not ready, uh, particularly when parents feel that it's much easier to have their kids in school with, you know, it's happy. In Malaysia, the parents are very happy if I can send my kids and let them spend six hours in school so that I can do what I want to do. All right? Uh, so that, that, that's, that's... But now, all right, but now the pandemic suddenly says that, okay, they cannot go to school. So for one and a half years, 300 over days, if I remember, everybody stuck at home. So the teachers are trying to develop what they can, not ready in the beginning in March. Uh, so what they do is they just take the curriculum, put some PowerPoints, go on it, get the teachers to start talking and so on. So a lot of trial and error. Yeah, so there were, there were many trial and error. But as it goes on this year, I understand that it gets better. Uh, people are trying to get more integrated things for the students to do. But you are right. But if the students are already studying online and haven't gone to meet the teachers, they say hello to their friends, peer, and so on. Uh, have anybody asked, are they better now or they were worse? Uh, so there was uh, this year, the SPM results came out. We were all shocked, uh, if you remember, that uh, the Ministry of Education said that it's the best results ever for some couple of years before. Meaning, are we trying to say that these people were doing their studies at home, these, the, the, these SPM people, they were studying at home, needed go, needn't go to school, and they did better in exams. Uh, that come back to the question. That is one I say. When you train people to pass exams, they just pass exams. That's all. All right. So, so when you ask the students to go online, what are the teachers trying to assess? Uh, so they, 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 so they, what are they trying to assess? So they ask them to do back some homework, and they, they, they. They put it into uh, whatever system that they can upload and the teacher try to assess them, ask them some questions and see whether they understand, can understand. But I still get back to it and say, if this thing is successful, did the Ministry of Education say, why are we still having semester? Why is still semester one, semester two, semester three? Why can't we cut short it and say now all these things that have been done uh, be become one whole year or just one semester? Because everything was done in a very much faster rate. Yeah, I, you, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, so, I but, we are not, uh, but we are not. So the, 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 the schools are telling that, okay, now you're coming back to semester three, especially private school. And I know of many private schools. And now you're coming back to semester three now or year four. Why? Because I want to collect your tuition fee. Right? So there is no... <laughs> you, 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 oh, tuition fee must be paid. Okay, so, oh, eh? but my, my children did not go to, to semester one or two at yeah. three. They, wasn't they were all at home. So how do you equate that years? So we are still stuck in the old thinking, just bringing old thinking system okay. into the technology. Uh, that's a you, concern. You know what? I think we're, we're not just both of us. I'm looking at the comments. Everybody is actually on the same page. Everybody acknowledges that the education system is out of out of whack. Everybody acknowledges that the education system is behind times. Uh, and uh, let me let me give you a sad example. In this age of the the, the smartphone uh, and apps, actually, reality, re realistically speaking, the education system of having to read and remember does not exist anymore because. Any answer you want, any answer you want is immediately accessible on the handphone. 
So I don't need to remember what year did the Portuguese invade Malacca. I don't re need to remember uh, how many kilograms of gandum was uh, imported every year from Argentina. Because if I really, really, really need to answer that question, I can get it immediately from Saudara Google. Similarly, with calculators, I remember going to school, and you know, this is from the 80s, where we were given a calculator, but then during the exam, tak boleh pakai. And I'm like, okay, that doesn't make sense. The technology, and we're talking ancient technology of the calculator, is here. Why are you still forcing me to work out what is the square root of nine, when I can just go square root of nine? Now, why are you forcing me to remember facts about history when I can read both real facts and fake facts about history. So I think if we do not catch up with the fact that everything is available in our hand and we are still forcing people to remember things when I'm not saying it's a good thing or bad thing, but when, you know, if we are not moving with this, this one is going to take over. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Exactly. So this is why I say uh, as parents, we still are being asked when we send our kids to primary school or secondary school, again, there are subjects. So you say eight subjects. We take SPM again. So you hear people studying eight subjects to 10 subjects. And then the parents are also happy when they score eight A's, 10 A's. I have a, a friend from Johor who runs an international school before this show who just sent me and very proud say that my, my, my kids there scored eight A's, six, 10 A's, you know, in the recent exams and so on. So again, we are still looking at something that is brick and mortar, if I have to say, still examinations. And people are so proud advertising and say they score eight A's. And eight A's means, or oh, the, 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 the people in the academic area will say, okay, eight A's means you are going to be a medical doctor. You're going to be an engineer. You're going to be an architect. If you want to be an artist and be a comedian, like you, no, 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 no. How on earth, why do you it is choose to be a comedian or, or, or teacher like me? So you see, this, this has to change. Because like what you say, a person who do not score eight A's has got this handphone. He has got much more knowledge than a person who scored eight A's. Without the handphone. Because, yeah, well, yeah. so he, he can, he, he, he's, he's smarter actually. And I've seen that many in today's kid. Uh, so therefore, Going back to what you just mentioned, so if assessment methods in schools, primary, secondary, and even in universities are not going to be changed and still based on examinations, the, what we have said for MCE and SPM is exactly the same. Subjective question, multiple questions, whatever it is. I have not seen any changes. Science lab, physics, chemistry, biology is still the same. I have not seen any changes now. Right? So how on earth are you going to produce medical doctors who have the basics of sciences, biology, chemistry to be better, that can use technology? Uh, you, you get what I mean? All right? So this was not taught. But th so what I'm trying to say, we have to do away with this. Why can't we get rid of all this assessment method and change it with other modes of assessment? One good example that I always tell people is, if someone, if you want someone to write an essay of 500 words and evaluate him. Yeah, for 500 for grammar and English and start, start minusing marks here and there. Why don't you ask him to actually record a video? Because he, every day, this kid is using this. He's chatting with his friend. He knows how to use uh, uh, whatever the apps there, the videos app there, and he record himself telling about my family. I believe he speaks better English because he's brought up and he may he speak even more than 500 words and assess him on the video that he submitted, which is real by him, rather than force him to go into the grammar. I'm not saying that grammar is not important. Don't get me wrong. All the English teachers will kill me. All right. But you go for, you go to the, look at the ends. What is the ends? And then you get the means to get it. So if his first video produced and he has some English mystic, broken English and there, so be it. Because that's what he is. Then you get the teacher to go to the video and improve where is his grammar. Why did he say, well, why did he say he are? So these are things that we should change. Then education and assessment become dynamic, not stuck in the mud, not just static. 
we will actually get into, uh, I think we're all on the same page right now. We are agreeable that the current system is archaic and old. Next, we're going to be talking into what are the specific changes that can be made. Before that, I, I want to play a couple of clips from people who have sent in their video questions. This first one is from uh, Jeremy Yi. So let's have a listen to him uh, and see what he has got to ask. Hi, uh, Mr. Arush Skanda and Dr. J. Lesio. Uh, as a student, uh, I have one question that I would like to ask Dr. J. Lesio. Um, how do we improve the educational system, especially on science and maths? Because we could see that the educational system is deteriorating. For example, the previous government emphasized on a must-pass in history and not maths in SPM. What is Dr. Jailer's your reaction view towards this issue? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Yeah, uh, shall I take that question? All right. Yeah, well, Before that, number I... one, is, is that true that uh, Sejara became a must-pass? Yes, not, yes, no. it become a must pass. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, let, yeah, it was some, <laughs> My wife said yeah. she would have confirmed fail already. Yeah, that is because uh, <laughs> I I don't like to say politicians because but I think that is because the politicians decided that these people don't love the country anymore, right? And they want to choose the opposition, so they must learn history. Now that's basically the reason. Other than that, I don't think there are other reasons. Huh? Yeah. And of course, the question should be what history would they learn? Yeah, correct. So and that is the, as I said, the curriculum is decided by them. All right, but anyway, I, I, I before this, I was looking at uh, this this uh, this international ex, uh, measurement called PISA, P I S A, Program for International Student Assessment, which is done every three years, and the last was in uh, in 2018. So Malaysia will go into PISA. All right, so this examination is 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 a, is, is an international exam to measure the people's skill, the 15 year old skills in mathematics, science, and reading. And in 2018, we were number 48 in Malaysia. We have 48 top in the country, China. Now, can you imagine? So is it uh, chi China? All right. And then Singapore, our neighbor, Macau, Hong Kong, uh, Canada, Finland, Ireland, Korea, and so on and so on. But we are 48. Yes, we have gone down in the understanding of mathematics and science, truly. Because for years, we have been debating on whether we should teach English and science in Bahasa Malaysia or English. I will just say that. The language of science, STEM, the language of knowledge, the language of skill sets is not determined by whether it is Bahasa Malaysia or English. If the world has moved on with the language of technology is English, so be it. So that actually, if we cannot decide on that, we have deteriorated. So my simple answer to uh, our friend here, how do we want to improve? Number one, get back to English, all right? Number two, get the teachers, all right? Teachers are very important. This is where I was trying to share in my next later that we have actually very pathetic. Our teachers in Malaysia were not like the days that we have when we were in school. They are not well trained. They are not trained to teach. All right, and that's a pathetic situation in this country, and moreover, in the subjects that they are meant to teach. Yeah, so if you want to teach maths and science and technology, it's not any language teacher can simply teach that subject. You must have the basic foundation of maths and science to teach maths and the methodology to teach maths and science, and that's and that comes from the teacher, the methodology comes from the teacher. And, uh, yeah, I can't speak for the teachers uh, currently in the education system, but I do remember during my time, the teachers were uh, career teachers. They chose to be teachers. They, that was their goal, their ambition. And, and uh, during school, we hated all of them during school. Uh, but after school, I began to appreciate the work that they put in. So um, on that note, I just want to say to Jeremy Yi uh, for your question, we are going to send you a copy of... Uh, Professor Jail's book, Out of Whack. Please WhatsApp me your address as well. And for all the great questions, I think, uh, how many books can give can we give away, Dr. Jails? Five, five. 
Five. We will give away five books. We're giving away one. We're going okay. to give another one away to uh, this next question. Plus, we're going to be taking questions from uh, the audience right now. So send in the questions and we will choose the best questions. This next question comes from a gentleman called G.H. And Dr. Jills, perhaps you'd like to Hello, look at this Hello, good evening, Professor Dato and Hari Iskandar. Okay, I want to ask one question. Currently, we have SK, okay, uh, Sekolah China, Sekolah Tamil. So, in the future, if we want to improve, should we, not can we, uh, should we change the system or maintain the system? And why should we maintain or change? Thank you very much. So, I think the question he's asking is about vernacular schools, uh, especially in the system that we have in Malaysia. What are your thoughts on this? Actually, I, 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 for education purpose, if we talk just for the sake of education, in the, there is, if, if it's for the education and the gaining of knowledge and skill sets, it doesn't matter. It has got nothing to do with vernacular schools. Chinese independent schools, they do what they want. They teach in a way. Indian schools and Kabang Saan schools. So education can be delivered in the language that it has to be delivered. Right? As long as the children and the teachers are well trained into that area. All right. So I, 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 do, I see no reason. But of course, if you're talking about national integration and so on, that's a, a subject that much to be debated, which I do not wish to go into that debate. All right. But I believe uh, you, you have seen Japanese, Japanese doing very well. All right. So Japanese schools, they teach wherever. At one time, we were all rushing to go and study in Japan. And you must learn Japanese. If you go to a Japanese university, it becomes a language of knowledge. So if Bahasa Malaysia can be a language of knowledge, why not? If Mandarin is a language of knowledge, why not? If Tamil is a language of knowledge for the people of Malaysia who are from the Indian community, and later they are going to go to India to pursue their medicine in Indian language, why not? Because it's a, it's a language of knowledge and a language of school. So let's not confuse ourselves with so-called uh, uh, integration uh, of politics. Yeah, that's my, my answer. Okay, fair, fair enough. I agree with you that uh, uh, for me, in my opinion, uh, there seems to be a lot of stress on uh, language. But you are right. If it is, if it, if it can communicate and it is a language of knowledge, then I see absolutely no harm in, um, in, in, in the study of it. Plus, I just want to take you up on your earlier comment, this thing about grammar. Yes, grammar is important, but I think communication is equally, if not more important. So I get a lot of messages from people. Uh, sorry, Abahari, my, my English not so good. I not so good. I'm like, actually, it doesn't matter if your English is, in your words, not so good. If you're able to communicate and I am able to understand and you're able to understand me, grammar, although important, should not be the most important thing, if, if you understand what I'm saying. Communication, for me, is more important than just grammar and communication in, in any language. So, yeah, uh, so I'm also answering our friend GH question there. But uh, just a quick question, uh, Jails. What, what is your educational background? Where did you like come through from Budak Kecil? Oh, well, well, you know, I, I, I go to my primary school is, of course, I come from a very poor family. So we, I come from a Kabang San school. At that, that time, it's called National Type. And then I went to secondary schools. And then after that, I went to, to go into a teacher training. I got my education oh, in to become a teacher. All right. My, I was daughter wants to, sorry, my daughter wants uh, to say goodnight. Hi. Good night. Um, and I have a chance to go to, to a, a local university in Malaysia. And I did my master's in UK and, and had the opportunity to do my doctorate in Europe. Uh, I, I'd oh. like to pick one question, sorry. Yeah, a prop. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think Kaima says something about uh, I, I saw him says that he, he says that teachers are trained well, but they are loaded and with paperwork. And therefore, they cannot fall, focus on their core job, which is teaching. I agree with Kaima. When, when I say that teachers are not trained well, I like to clarify that in Malaysia. Even back then, when I was started as a teacher, yeah, I was trained three years at that time. We were the first batch to be trained as a teacher. I was trained to teach English and math, English. And we were the first cohort to send to Sarawak to teach oh, really? English. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we were, we were the first, we are the, and, and it's very surprisingly, I do not know why they want to send us to go and teach the Sarawakians English when they were speaking English better than us, yeah, at that time. 
So that's, this is what I'm trying to say, something wrong with the system. But I never got to teach English for the five years I was in, in the education sector. Well, I was I asked to teach mathematics. I was asked to teach Bahasa Malaysia. All right, because at that time, I was, uh, when I went into teacher training, uh, the gov the I, I went in after Form 6, which means my grade is C1. So C1 means you can teach this subject. So the, the headmasters and so on decide things that you cannot say no. So I have to start learning Bahasa Malaysia to teach SPM Bahasa Malaysia at that time. Can you believe me? I was supposed to teach English, then I go and teach Bahasa Malaysia. But of course, as a teacher, we learn to teach. And he is correct. Today, teachers are also teach are also trained in Malaysia to teach all those important subjects, but they are asked to teach the subject that they are not trained to, just to fill the gap of no teachers in that school. A very bad plan education uh, transfer of teachers. And, and worse of all now, all the teachers now are asked to do a lot of paperwork. I agree. All right, so a lot of them, remember, the job of a teacher is to teach. The job of a nurse Right, Florence Nightingale, when they talk about nurses those days in UK, England, they produce the best nurses. Everybody wants to go to England. Uh, if you remember, Harry, they produce the best loving nurses. Right? They love you. They hug you. You just love when you're in their hands. You don't fall sick. All right? Hello, nurse. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, so, but, so teachers are like Florence Nightingale. Uh, those teachers that I have, they were big. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to say they were loving. They were passionate. They speak with a loud voice like me. Uh, they're like a motherly character, and if they are like a man, my, I remember my, my English teacher used to come with a cane. So that kind of fatherly and that kind of teacherly. But look at our teachers today. Goodness, they get threatened by the students. You, you, you get what I mean? So we, we have a problem in, in the training. Wow. And why? Because teachers are not being actually valued that anymore in society. So you pick teachers who do not do, you pick SPM students who do not do well, and okay, you don't have this, uh, you don't have enough credits to do this, so you come and become teachers. Again, why I hate the system about credits. Why? Why distinction credits? So you start to differentiate. Okay, A people must be doctors. Okay, the D one, okay, all become teachers. So that becomes the perception. Those who do not do well become teachers. Right? But those days when I was in the kampung, you know, when I was sent in Sarawak, the whole kampung loved me so much, you know. That time I was only 20 years old, small little boy standing there. But they look at us and these are teachers, you know, because we were trained very well, I remember, the three years. Thank you. Okay, let me, let me ask you this. How to change? We're talking about change? Okay, how to change? What, what can be done? Okay, first, yeah, very important. Uh, and of course, in this country, we still have certain bodies, right? As I say, Ministry of Education will take care of the primary schools to the secondary school. It falls under that ministry. Higher education takes care of the college and the university's level, all right? And then everybody has got their different agencies. So in Malaysia, you got the mil mil MQA, Malaysia Quality Agency, that looks after qualities of tertiary education. Now, all these, they are doing their work. They are putting in the system. They are doing what they want to do. However, I believe if you want to really do changes and real reform, education must be run by professional academicians, not politicians. The ministry must be run by the assinator. And I'm saying that because I heard that we're going to have a new government tomorrow. You know, I think Harry, you and I maybe can apply for the job of, a, of the Minister of Education. All right? So, they, it oh, must be... No, uh, no I, must, I, I don't, I don't must have the SPM so results. And we must give credence to the di Director General of Education. They are the, they are the people who got this, not the politicians. Because the politicians will flip-flop. You remember, we have the white shoe, black shoes. We have this and that when we were talking so excitingly and then starting to keep quiet. Right? So there are, so this, this has to come from this view power. And 
the riot, we as the consumer, as the people must actually tell the government. And I hear, I hope the government will listen to this. And after your show, because your show has, uh, you have bring in the YBs and YBs and so on. All right. So I hope they will listen to this. And they will seriously think that we appoint. And people have been doing that in New Zealand, even Indonesia, our neighbor. They bring in the professionals. Don't come to politics. We will, we will appoint you to sit in that ministry and give you the budget to run it. I think that's the only way we can reform and change what has not been changed for the last 60 years, Arif. Uh, it's, it sounds like a good plan, but uh, I, I can't say that I'm hopeful something like that is going to happen. Uh, we, uh, <laughs> I, I know, I, I, I'm, I agree that something has to happen. I just, it, it's just, it seems like a huge mountain to climb. But I'm, I'm hopeful there are a lot of people. I don't know uh, anybody out there. If you're, if you're watching, are there any teachers out there who are following this this episode? Let us know what you think. Uh, share this this live streaming. Also, uh, if there are any um, uh, educationalists out there, uh, not just necessarily teachers, but you know. Uh, anybody involved in the education system, also let us know your thoughts. Uh, we'll be very, very excited and glad to hear from you. Now, uh, Professor Gilles, let me let me give you a, a proposition, right? Okay, so let's just say, let's just say for some weird uh, X-Files reason, you were suddenly decided to throw in and uh, made the Minister of Education tomorrow. Uh, the way uh, Masli was thrown in out of the blue. What are the first, I wouldn't even say five steps, what are the first two steps that you would take, given, not to say that can or cannot be done, but you would say immediately we have to implement this. Two steps. Well, first, I think immediately we have to really look at personalizing education. As I say, do not put people in boxes. We have to start looking at whatever model. And as some people was putting some remarks that uh, a lot of technocrats, a lot of people were, were actually being appointed or, or being taken by the Ministry of Education to, to take out, to form the blueprint and so on. But let's go to it and say, we must be bold enough to start looking at personalizing education from kindergarten to secondary school. In other words, you do not you have to be bold enough to look at not saying that you need to follow primary one, these are the subjects. You must go through these subjects to proceed to primary two, primary three, primary four. Be brave enough to personalize it. Be brave enough to let all the students, right, who comes in, start to give them the creative thinking when they are young. All right, let them play around. Let them move around with integrated modules and studies and so on. And let them let us discover their cognitive skills, discover their other skills as we move along. And then we personalize it. And therefore, they, they take certain subjects as they go along when they are ready to be assessed. Now, I read that some countries assess their students every year. Here in primary school, at one time, we assess them five years. Then we start to say that, okay, they have reached the status. And after that, we get rid of the six years. We can do that assessment, we continuous assessment yearly on how the kid progressed from year one, if we still want to call it year one, to year two years. So I think that personalized education is the first thing that we must do. The second thing that I like to suggest is, then we look at the tertiary education. We because if we do not churn out graduates that are now already in the system, 30 years later, 10 years, 5 years later, 20 years later, they are going to be the leaders. They are going to be our leaders, political leaders, economic leaders, and so on and so on. We have to revamp that. We have to look at why do we still need to look at putting in certain entry requirements that are so stringent, why it must be three credits? Why is it 
must be five, five credits. Why not other criteria? Right? If someone wants to do other subjects in business, entrepreneurship, or IT, and so on, if they are not engineering and medicine and so on, why don't we change that? Why don't we allow for everybody to have the opportunity to come to university education, change the system, all right? Uh, as you move along, it does not mean that you must do a three years in a university for a degree or a three years diploma. They can do a one year, get out into the industry, come back, continuous learning in university, build up their skill sets, completely change that. So you give knowledge, at the same time, you give them skill sets. So move into skill sets in tertiary education. I just so, wanna, okay. I just wanna hold you there, Prof, because uh, Mike Angelo Carvalho says I agree about accessing cognitive um, abilities. I was a dyslexic as a child, but I never knew I was dyslexic, and my teachers just assumed I was a bad student. Uh, I think my camera has frozen, but yes, exactly what you were saying. Uh, I, I'm presuming. Can you guys hear me? Yes, yes, yes. We can hear you. Okay, I'm just gonna pull on my camera. What have you got to say? Yeah, I, I was a. I wasn't dyslexic, but I was just a bad student myself. But good point, uh, Angel Carvajal. I was dyslexic and a good student. My wife says she was dyslexic and a good student. What do what you got to say about that, Dr. Jills? Does Mike have a point? Yeah, yeah, I think he, he has a point. That's why I say if we, if we use the same system and examine people by subjects, you are not catering for people who have... Uh, this this uh, uh, this uh, this uh, dialectic, for example, uh, you're not catering for people, and you're not catering for what, what we call as the late learners, because your system says that in order for you to move to tertiary education, you must pass eight subjects, you must get so many credits, or you cannot go to university or college to pursue, and therefore it is wrong. I, I agree. I agree with you there. I was a I was a late learner. Uh, my classes would start at seven forty five. I always arrive at eight ten. I was always late. But I don't think that fell under the category of late learner. But uh, you are you are uh, you you have a point there, Doc, Dr. Jills. Uh, once again, I'm thank you for answering uh, those two questions. I just want to bring up um, uh, a point here from Kip. Kinting, government education is subsidized. Of course, they will prioritize those who can generate the greatest difference. Uh, once again, that's because uh, should the government be looking after education at the end of the day, or should it just be privatized all the way through? No, no. I, I think the government. It is the job of the government to look after education. Uh, the, the thirteen years of education that is needed for for every child in this country uh, is the job of the government. All right, but doesn't mean that when it's the job of the government, they should they should not improve it. They should not provide it with better quality teachers, all right? And they should not say, okay, if you want a, a better education, uh, if you think that uh, we you want better quality, go to private school or international school. That is the picture. That is the perception that I think the government is telling the people. So those in the urban areas feel that okay, I'm not going to send my kids to uh, to government school. Uh, because they, they have bad, they have lousy teachers, the curriculums are not good, and so on. So I sent to private schools, international school in the urban area, pay a huge amount of money. That's not right. The government can still do the same thing. Yeah, so they, they, it is their right. Otherwise, why do you collect taxes? All right, so uh, why do you, uh, yeah, you, you can build more schools if you, uh, if you spend uh, you spend money correctly. That's what I'm trying to say. All right. Those days when we were educated, your fathers, our great father, there were no private schools. Why were we better? Why were we better in what we are doing today? All right. But today, why is it that you have, if you have a choice, why is it that you're not sending your kids to government school anymore? Because the perception and, but not all government schools are like that. Uh, that's a problem. That is, uh, that is an issue that I think will rage on, uh, regardless of the whoever the government is and whoever the education minister is, uh, with that, Dr. Jails, I just uh, I, I I know we could talk about this all night. Uh, I think if anybody else wants to hear more about uh, your opinion and your thoughts, it's all in this book. 
out of whack. Is this out in the stores already? It can be purchased yes, online? Yes, yes. Yeah, they are in uh, MPH, but because the bookstores are closed, but otherwise they they, they, they can anytime uh, text you and they can order online. Yeah. Actually, uh, bookstores, I think, have just opened again, but you are right, everything is online right now. Uh, I'm going to be picking out three other questions from uh, the people who have commented here, and we will be sending you a copy of Out of Whack. Before we go, Dr. Jails, uh, is there anything you would like to say just to wrap this up? Uh, anything that uh, may or may not be in this book? but uh, something hopeful for us to move forward uh, as Malaysians? Well, I, I think as, as Malaysians, uh, I, I just like to say that um, every one of us play a role in education. And I keep telling people that what is happening today in our country is all the foundation of education. So if we are unhappy with the leaders today, it is a result of the education system. It's a result of how they have been educated when they were young. Right? So, and along the line. So we have to be serious that if we want our new generation of people to be better leaders than us, we have to seriously look at educating them and giving them the education that they need. Not only cognitive, not only academic, but of course, spiritually, moral education, someone asked this now, all right? Uh, as well as the holistic part of it, Right. And of course, uh, uh, there are many topics in education, uh, creative thinking, uh, as well as others. But before you can go into all these things, until and unless we really look at it and say, we do not want our kids anymore to go into a system of six years, five years, and then even then, if it's not good enough, we have to spend money and put into international school. Not good enough, we have to spend money on tuition just because we are chasing after 11 A's or 10 A's. And that's what parents are doing. This is frightening. And then all working hard and say, okay, uh, our system in Malaysia, our universities are bad. Let's save a lot of money, uh, pawn the house, rob, the, rob your neighbor and send them to UK and US to study and they don't come back. Talents are gone. Uh, that's wrong. Yeah, so I think we have to, a role to play now that everything is online because of the pandemic. And I see all parents today are playing a role teaching the kids and they start, start to understand it is not easy to teach a kid. They shouted at the children. I, I, I see my son shouting at the kids and so on. So I know. Then they realize that actually it's not easy to teach the, the teachers are right. So when the teachers raise their voice to your kids, they understand why. So at the end of the day, if all of us in society values teachers and want our children to also be trained as teachers in Malaysia and not look to that as a low level job, just fight out our salary is only two or three thousand and, uh, and uh, happy, you know, then I think there is hope in Malaysia because every one of us will want our children to be educationists too well, and play the role collectively to educate our generation. On that note, uh, well said, Dr. Jails. I just want to say thank you again for spending your time with us. And thank you uh, for, for uh, allowing us to uh, give out this book to uh, the two people who sent in the video question and three more people that we will pick later to, to have an opportunity to get your book. Thank you again, sir. Uh, and uh, uh, I know tonight a lot of Malaysians will be waiting with bated breath to see what happens tomorrow. And uh, who knows? We may or may not have a new situation uh, and we may or not may or may not have a new uh, education minister. But with that note, thank you very much, Professor Doctor. And I do wish you all the best and to stay safe and stay healthy. And we will talk you to you too. soon. Thank you again you for spending too. your time you with too. us. And all the audience, stay safe, stay well. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys, there you go. I tell you, this kind of uh, topic, uh, education, it could go on forever and ever. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Jails, for joining us. Uh, I have had a great time reading some of your comments. <laughs> you guys make me laugh, I got to say. I got to say, you guys make me laugh. Uh, and uh, I will uh, be contacting some of you because some of you spotted some things which, uh, you know, were not brought up during the conversation. Guys, um, What's going on Malaysia is a sh is a show that I gave an, I gave it the title What's going on Malaysia because basically it is a question that um, I pose to myself and I pose to uh, the country 
to, to find out really where are we headed and what is going to happen to us. And the intention of inviting my guests is basically to have a chat because it is my belief, kepercayaan saya, bila kita bercakap, bila kita berbincang, and we get to talk to people, we get a little bit closer to answering that question, what's going on, Malaysia? Uh, and has that question been answered tonight? Not in its entirety, but definitely a little bit closer. So I want to thank you all for uh, sticking around. Thank you all for commenting. Uh, if you're watching the show, once again, let me say, if you're watching the show after it's live, the next day, you're during breakfast or you're driving or something, thank you. Remember, if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe on that bell right here. Click on that bell. And if you're watching on Facebook, also share, share. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much from Irene Yap. Thank you, Raman Yi. I got to say a shout out to Raman Yi, this guy right here. Let me, uh, where, Raman Yi, Raman Yi, where are you? Raman Yi. He, he is on, he's already online before the show starts and he's already commenting and he sticks around till the end of the show. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Aiko Wong, also for um, watching the show and for being with us. Siu Mei, thank you, Uji, John Lim. People have different opinions. Yes, Firdaus, Anapia, great show, buddy. Guys, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's going to be, uh, I don't know whether you think it's going to be a long night or a short night, but everybody's uh, holding their breath for what's happening tomorrow. At the end of the day, no matter what happens, I hope that uh, we are left in a situation where Malaysia and Malaysians in general are a little bit more hopeful, uh, a little bit more positive, and together I'm... I truly believe uh, that it is rakyat untuk rakyat, kita jaga kita, and I hope all of us who have been on this stream uh, watching can find a way to, to work together, find a way to answer those questions uh, to make Malaysia a better place um, and finally get the answer to the question, what's going on Malaysia? With that, I want to say good night. Assalamualaikum. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you.